podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what coast you're joining us from. I want to thank uh, those of you who have attended uh, and registered early. Uh, the session is going to begin in about seven minutes, so I just wanted to come on real quick and let you know that you're in the right place and uh, you want, you're not hearing audio right now. We won't be starting the audio portion until we get a little bit closer to the top of the hour to do a couple of quick house cleaning items. So that said, um, now's a good time to fill those coffees up and uh, get what you need situated. Uh, we'll be back on in just a few minutes to get things kicked off. Thank you very much. Brief pause and it'll be mute for a couple minutes. Again, for those of you who joined early, uh, I just want to let you know that you are in the right place. Uh, the brief pause here in the audio is uh, just as we continue getting set up, uh, but the audio portion will start in just a few moments as we get closer to the top of the hour.
Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here. So I figured I'd come on and do a couple of quick house cleaning items before the session kicks off uh, live, probably at 1 p.m. <clears throat> um, first and foremost, a uh, couple of just kind of logisticals. You know, the session right now is booked for a solid hour. I don't know if we're going to go right till the end, um, but probably pretty close to it. I want to encourage everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, to ask questions as we go through the session today. You do that with the question function on your GoToWebinar panel. You'll see it on the right-hand side of your screen. It has a little triangle next to it. If you open that up, you can type your question in. Now, how we typically work questions is we respect everybody's privacy. So what we do is when we get to the end, uh, if we see questions on there, we'll read the question. We won't read your name. We won't read your company. We won't read your email out. We'll just read the question out. And our uh, speaker, uh, Chris, <clears throat> will... Um, We'll do his best to answer the question if we don't get to your question or if we don't answer the question in its entirety. What we typically do is send out a uh, kind of a document within a few days after the session where we answer everybody's questions in print and we just kind of send out a list of the questions with the appropriate answers along with those. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a couple of other quick things. Today's session will be recorded, uh, so you will get a link to a YouTube copy uh, of today's session that you can share with some compatriots back in your office or your laboratory uh, if they weren't able to attend today. I will also send out a PDF version of the deck, uh, so you'll get that as well. Usually within about 24 to 48 hours after the session, we'll get all that stuff processed and send it out to everybody. So that brings us right up to 1 o'clock. Uh, there's going to be a brief pause where I come back on and we begin the recording. So just a brief pause, and bear with us one sec. <clears throat> Chris, as you're the organizer, you're going to need to go ahead and hit the start recording. All set. Okay, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us for today's session entitled Supporting Your Laboratory Informatics Ecosystem with Laboratory Informatics as a Service. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So as we go through today's session, a couple quick things uh, we will... <clears throat> Give you a brief overview of who Asterix is. Um, you know, why do we have the right to talk to you about this thing today? Where our, our levels of expertise lie, etc. You can go next slide, Chris. A little bit about the company. Um, first and foremost, you know, Asterix is made up of informatics professional services and staffing, uh, which is dedicated 100% to the scientific community. So all of our staffing business is scientific staffing in nature, and all of our professional services is geared around uh, the informatics world. So basically laboratory infrastructure and software. Um, <clears throat> Chris McClure, who's your presen presentation lead today, uh, is one of our managing directors in this space. He handles a geographic area. Uh, and He oversees all the major projects uh, for managed services uh, in this space. A couple of quick stats on Asterix before we get into it. Um, we've been around a while. We've been around since 1995, probably held company. Uh, it originated as the IT division of a company called APBI, which was a $300 million life science a research organization. It had split out of that, and today we operate in eight offices with uh, 650 employees. Uh, headquarters are in Red Bank, uh, New Jersey. There's a staffing division, which does both public and private sector staffing uh, of scientific and IT resources. So everything from the federal to state governments uh, through life sciences. <clears throat> and then there's a professional services division, which is what today's about. Uh, this group is focused exclusively on helping science-based organizations um, improve uh, their overall technology footprint, modernize it in some cases, and uh, integrate it where possible, and, and basically streamline it. The companies that we typically work with are Fortune 1000 Life Science Enterprise government research institutions uh, with large and fast-growing IT and compliance needs. <clears throat> the mission from us is to deliver scalable, uh, sustainable solutions in IT and staffing for the scientific community. That is our mission, and that's what we're here to do today. So, uh, Chris, you can hit next slide. In terms of the professional services that are offered by the organization, and I'll move through this quickly because I want to make sure we get into the, uh, the content for today. Uh, there's business process analysis. This is where we can come in and basically make sure that anything that you're investing in technology-wise is going to meet your needs. It's difficult with the myriad of tools and tech uh, that are out there today to know for sure, am I picking the right one? Am I spending the right amount? Is this thing going to do exactly what my lab 
uh, needs it to do. So we, we help you with that. And then there's enterprise architecture, <clears throat> making sure that we help you design the right technology solutions. There's, there's actual technology selection services along with the traditional things like development implementation of systems. So if you're purchasing a LIMS, Asterix is one of those companies that can come in and basically install it and then get you trained up on it. And then even do things like uh, the computer systems validation, which is obviously required uh, by the FDA. Uh, there's overall just a wide array uh, of services. And then we can kind of put people in place if need be on uh, a scientific and technology background to help you run um, the solution uh, if that's if that's a need. So. Um, with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get uh, get going on today's session, which is about data integrity, which is obviously an extremely important topic today. Uh, none better than Chris McClure in this area uh, to talk to you about it. He's been involved with many, many projects over the years. So, uh, Chris, I'm going to quiet down now and let you take over and uh, and enlighten us with your with your wealth of knowledge in this space. Sure. Just just a, a quick correction. The the last slide was the. Uh, promo for the Asterix February webinar, which is on data integrity. Um, so we're going to be doing that on Thursday, February 27th. That's right. Um, I apologize. Be, yes. Today we're talking about managed services. Thanks, Chris. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and as an FYI uh, for everybody, for this session that's happening on the 27th, um, we will be sending out a link as well. Uh, there's a link right on the website. I'll, I'll cover that even when we get when we get to the back end. But thanks for the correction, Chris. I appreciate that. All good. All good. So. All right, um, supporting your laboratory informatics ecosystem with a laboratory informatics as a service, an uh, L-I-A-A-S. <clears throat> so uh, we are playing around with that acronym. Not sure we're gonna keep it. It's actually kind of a mouthful. Uh, but the idea is here that we're gonna be talking about managed services and managed services in a laboratory environment. Uh, so that's going to be the, the real crux of today. Um, I've broken this talk into two different sections. Uh, we're going to spend the majority of time discussing how to select a managed service provider. Uh, what are the things that you would be looking for them to have as you're going through your process, uh, such that you're going to have confidence that you've selected the right one uh, that can meet the needs of your scientists, meet the needs of your, your IT partners and such. Um, at the end, I'm going to spend four slides talking specifically about the areas that Asterix focuses on, and uh, we will wrap up with that. So, uh, so with that being said, thank you for your attending today. I uh, appreciate you giving us the hour. And uh, we will cover any questions at the end. So please feel free to add those to your, your WebEx questions, um, and we will get to those. Okay. Um, if we take a look back, uh, I started in life sciences in the early 90s. Um, and at the time, everybody was a full-time employee. Uh, you then saw sort of the, what I call the contractor revolution. All of a sudden, pharma companies needed to make Wall Street investors happy. They did that by making themselves look smaller by having contractors. Um, the contractor crusade grew up until the federal employment law changed a couple of years ago, which then said you can no longer have contractors or temporary employees fulfilling full-time roles or activities that would normally be covered in a full-time role. Um, CROs have always been with us. Um, but with the federal employment law change, you really saw a rise in managed services. Okay? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, if you look at a typical pharma company, um, I call this sort of a modern approach to life sciences. Uh, we still have the full-time employees. Okay? Those are the bread and butter of the companies. We want those people to be the ones who the companies are investing in that are making the critical decisions, making the discoveries, making the differences. The rest of it is now designed to support those people. So you have your commodity CROs, your specialty CROs. These are groups that have gone and looked to do work which is predictable, work which is going to require a certain skill set. Uh, and it really goes in and now supports the overall research or manufacturing that's going on. And the area that we're going to play in is managed service providers. With managed services, you're now talking about the foundation. Okay. This is the piece where everybody needs to have the appropriate level of support, level of technology for them to do their work. Um, it's not necessarily sexy, but at the same point, it's essential. Okay. So we're going to talk really about how to go through and evaluate a managed service provider, make sure that they're the right people uh, for your work. 
Okay. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a pause to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Team augmentation or staff augmentation is when you're going to go out, talk to a company, and you're going to contract them for a resource. Okay? It's that they are delivering a resource. They're not delivering scope. They're not tied to any service delivery. Okay? It's just time and materials. It's the hours that they're bringing forward. Okay? There's a real value in team augmentation. When you're running a project, when you need to scale up a team in short order, a short-term team augmentation is, is terrific. And it's a very valuable part of how we all deliver our, our IT support today. If we talk about managed services, the big pivot here is that we're now going to deliver an outcome. So we never talk about how many resources. We don't talk about the fact that Jim is a great guy uh, because we're now talking about the fact that we're answering the phone, we're responding to tickets, we're addressing issues and incidents as they come up. Everything that we do is going to be tied to a service level. So there's an expectation up front where we define the scope and we define how quickly we're going to be responding to all of those tickets and incidences and issues as they come in. We talk about the fact that the delivery risk now remains with the provider. Uh, what I mean by that is the vendor is going to take on the delivery risk. Now, a lot of times people will raise their hand and say, well, if I'm, if I'm still tied to an MSP, then I'm still tied to the risk. And that's true, except there's a scenario where you're going to be protected because you have the SLAs, you have the contract, and you have the operational governance, which is going to make sure that you stay ahead of those problems. So it really is delivering an outcome. And this is the right way to deliver long-term sustainable services. Okay. Um, examples of managed services. These are the cafeteria ladies at my daughter's school. It is one of the best managed services that I know of. Um, they provide meals for the kids every single day. No kid goes hungry and everybody goes home happy. Uh, we have cafeteria staff in all of our biotechs and pharmas. Uh, it is one of the earlier examples of managing services. They reached out to Cisco, they reached out to Marriott, they reached out to the different uh, the different catering groups and for the managed service. We're now seeing an evolution where you're seeing it transition to site maintenance, building maintenance, uh, asset management. So in the sense of the groups that are coming in and doing all of your, your preventative maintenance on all of your instrumentation. And you're also seeing managed services now around scientific support. So you see people coming in to make media, to manage compounds, to even do assay screening. Um, and then in the, the latest example we have, we've got a big farmer that we work with, which is now taking their procurement group and they do it as a managed service. So the limit of what a managed service is really has no bounds. Okay? We'd like to now expand such that it's going to be life science IT. And when we start talking about that, we're now talking about the management of applications. We're talking about the support of the PCs. We're talking about IT project management, those sort of things, which, which really make it now that you have a strong foundation to run your research from. If we think in terms of why life science IT, okay, this is a laundry list. I'm not going to read it all out to you. But the important piece about all of this is that a managed service should be designed to fit your needs. Okay, the company should have a methodology. That methodology should be an industry standard methodology. They should have a practice for how they do this, but they should also come in and start with what do you need? Let's listen to the requirements. Let's build out the scope. Let's now build a service which is going to match what it is that your scientists need. Does it fit your culture? Does it have the right engagement model? Those sort of things. Okay. As we go through it, we talked about shifting the responsibility of execution to the MSP partner. That's all done through governance. Okay. The governance is going to be designed around measuring everything and then reporting all of those activities back so that there is visibility all the way through. It's all tied to an SLA. We're doing this on an annual, if not multi-year basis. That enables your flat budgeting. You know the spend that's gonna be coming. 
you still do retain your flexibility. Okay, so in the sense that if you go out and you buy a company, we can just add more resources to the managed service to now bring that in. Big piece here though, is that you're now going to have time and energy to focus on strategy and requirements. So your managed service team should be the ones that are gonna be out there, they're doing the execution, they're responsible for the outcome, you're now leading the charge. Okay. When you're selecting a vendor, I like to break it down into five different areas, and I like to make sure that they've got something in each of these. Um, if you're familiar with ITIL, these are the five ITIL pieces around managed services. Uh, it's a nice way to start in terms of making sure that all of the different areas are, are there. Uh, what is the strategy? So is the service strategy the right fit for you? Is it a vendor that works in sciences? Do they understand laboratories? Do their people have a scientific background? Okay. If that's important, do they tie in? When we start talking about service design, we want to hear what is their method? How do they come in and do an assessment? What are the pieces that they care about? How do they engage with you at this early time in order to make you feel comfortable that you're getting exactly what you need. Around service transition, okay, this is the first impression. Okay? And when I say the first impression, it's the first impression with your business stakeholders, your scientists, maybe your IT partners and such. Is the transition gonna work? Is there a plan? Is there a communication plan? Those sort of things. Service operation, we're talking about the run book. Everything should follow a process. Everything should be documented. And then the last piece, continual service improvement. Is it being built to grow? Is it going to be sustainable as it goes forward? Okay. I'm gonna do a couple of slides on each one of these to make sure that we're all on the same page with what I'm talking about on these, on these five different pieces. Okay, service strategy. I've got the asterisk bio here, and I'm using this as an example. Okay? We're a 20 year old company. We are the largest technology agnostic life science IT provider. Um, our IT people are life science IT people in the sense that they've been in labs, they've understood how a scientist thinks, they're able to communicate with a scientist. We have an extensive partner network the partner network gives us access to go ask those questions once we get into the, the really tricky tickets, the really tricky problems. Okay. It's a scenario which is built up and it's designed with an intent to deliver IT managed services. We don't play in other spaces. We don't do accounting. We don't do gas and mining. It's a scenario where we want to plan the life sciences. So when you're looking at your vendor, okay, ask those questions. Are they the right fit? Are they the right size? Do they have the right approach? Okay. I'm going to switch over to service design. Every single MSP engagement should start with an assessment. We strongly encourage the assessment to be a separate project that allows the person to come in understand the environment, do the business process mapping as needed, and make sure that we're not only understanding where the customer is today, but where are they going forward? Where do they want to go? An MSP, a startup of an MSP is one of those opportunities where you get a chance to sort of right the wrongs. You may have certain practices which are not ideal for your scientists. This is the chance to go in and, and adjust those and correct them. The assessment part, you're going to now be working with the vendor. You're going to be talking to them on a daily basis, understanding how they think, but more importantly, understanding how they problem solve. And that's one of these pieces which is going to be critical as we go forward. Coming out of the assessment, we're going to focus heavily on alignment and risk management. Okay? The alignment is going to now say the managed service, if we're doing run support of scientific application, okay, we know the full scope of applications. We know the full scope around what needs to be checked in terms of servers being up. We know how to engage the business. Okay. At the same time, we're also gonna be looking at risk management. Okay. Not only how do we maintain what we do in terms of the defined work around the MSP, uh, but also let's now think what happens if. 
that risk management piece should be a way where you're going to have business continuity, even in the case of something going down. Okay, so this is going to be something where we're looking at it early in the process. And as you're going through, we're making sure that we keep going back to it. Okay, is it working? Do we have any issues that are on a slow burn that are creeping up on us? Okay, so in terms of service design, we're heavily focused on assessment, alignment, and risk management. Governance is my favorite word. I love measuring things, reviewing those, understanding what the measurements mean, and then reporting them back to my clients. Um, in terms of governance, every MSP should have a full governance program. That starts with joint executive alignment. What that means is that my boss and, their, and my peers boss are talking. They want to make sure they're maximizing the value out of the MSP. We want to map our roadmap to your roadmap. We want to make sure that it's such that we are growing in a way where as we go forward, we are getting more and more out of it. At the level of the managed service managing director, okay, we'll have a peer on the client side where we're going to be working with them on a weekly and monthly basis to make sure that the SLAs are being hit, the KPIs are being hit, the service is being well received by the scientist. K metrics are great, sentiment is even better. Okay. I can close tickets quickly, but are the scientists happy? We wanna make sure that the scientists are happy. Okay. And then governance at a daily level comes from the operational delivery leader. They're the ones who are going to be looking at the tickets as they come in. They're gonna be addressing any tickets that keep coming up. Is there a learning that's required? Do we need to add something to the wiki or to the information uh, database? Uh, they're the ones that are gonna make sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, everything is working. In a good MSP, everything is being measured, everything is being reported, and everything is being reviewed. And that's the only way you can get better. We'll go back to that point in a minute. Third part, service transition. And I look at this as a transition plan. The transition plan has to be well-defined. It has to go into great detail. And it's going to be such that we're laying out all of the known risks that we have such that we can build this and transition this in a way which looks good. I talked about this being your first impression. If your transition is clean, people start to look at this and say, okay, I've got confidence in this group, it's gonna build. Then if something happens later, they'll give you a little bit more patience with it, a little bit more time. The transition plan is gonna be the how, the communication plan is going to be the outbound message. Okay? On our larger MSPs, we actually bring in our marketing department. The marketing department helps us craft that go-to market message that's got to go out to the scientists and the IT stakeholders. It's not just a sense that we're taking over your MSP, it's now how are we going to fit within their workflows? They're going to understand when we're coming, how to interact with us, we'll set up information sessions, but the communication plan is something where we try to have no surprises. Get the message out to make sure that people understand why we're doing this and how it's going to be better for them. And the last piece I have here is managed service operation transitions. Okay, this is really the startup. You know, we're now starting to record all of our measurements. We're starting to make sure that we've shadowed correctly. We understand how it's being done, but also we're reaching for how to go forward and where we need to be. Okay, so Transition plan, communication plan, two huge parts of your service transition. If anybody is trying to tell you you don't need those, you probably need a different vendor. I would also highly suggest you go into how are they going to staff their MSP. Nobody goes into a managed service program to spend more money. Um, I've had procurement people look me straight in the eye and say, I need a solid bronze service. And you ask for clarification and they say, look, they've had a gold, they've had an A plus service. 
Like we can't afford an A plus service. We need to go to a bronze service. So people move into MSPs really to save money. It simplifies a lot of the operations and all that, but there is that element. So you have to ask your vendor, how are they gonna be able to do that? Do they have the critical mass of people that are both on site, off site and near shore? Okay. Can you bring people in such that they can work around the timelines of your company's operation? Okay. If it's based out in India and they're only gonna work Indian hours, that might not be ideal you know, for your San Francisco biotech. Okay. The other piece, press them on how do they invest in their MSP employees. Uh, I've been in professional services a long time. One of the great things about delivering of managed services is the employees who are there actually live two lives. They live as a member of the company that they're delivering for. They also live as a member of the company that they are employed by. Okay, so it's two different groups. They get to have a professional service career which allows them to develop technical skills. It gives them paths as far as going to being a technical guru or becoming a, a manager of people. It gives them that ability to grow within the company and do different things. So ask them, how do they manage their employees? How do they invest in their employees? Okay. And then the last piece will say, ask them if they're committed to growing. Professional services, the only way you can deliver more work is to hire more people. Okay. I'm sure, yeah, I'll argue that you can be more efficient. You can clean up your processes. That's, that's true. Okay. But the reality is, you need more people to deliver more work. Uh, if the company is not embracing that, if they're not going out and looking for the best and the brightest, if they're not going out and trying to train more people so you can actually handle the demands, it's a red flag. Okay? And you really wanna be in a situation to, to make sure that you know that ahead of time. And so um, in terms of service transition, transition plan, communication plan, but then look heavily at how are they gonna staff their team. Okay, last bit, and this is really in the proving area. Do they have the critical mass of expertise? Again, who are their resources? What are they trained in? Who are they partnered with? How quickly can they access different bits of information? Okay. And this is just an example of important companies in the life sciences where if you're gonna be delivering an MSP, you have to understand what they do. You have to have a working relationship with them in order to be able to, to get their attention, to address the, the tickets and incidences as they come up. Okay. Uh, switching to the fourth piece, service operations. Um, methodology is my second favorite word after governance. And I believe that everything should be part of the methodology. You can have a center of excellence, but make sure it's defined. Make sure there's a run book. You want everything to be documented in terms of how they are going to engage. And the important piece about an MSP is that if we lose a resource, we should be able to roll a new resource in. If everything has been done by the book, by the process, there is no tribal knowledge that is lost when that individual leaves. So you have to have a methodology to, to oversee all of this. Okay? Um, we have a program management office as well. Uh, on our larger MSPs, they provide an additional level of organization to, to make sure that everything is, is happening in a clean and efficient way. Uh, when we talk about service delivery, um, these are the sort of things we're looking at, you know, event management, incident management, uh, request fulfillment, access management, making sure that people have the right access to their users, um, and then problem management. Uh, problem management is one of the most, the more important pieces. You're trying to look now at doing root cause analysis. How do you solve the problem, not just for the immediate need, but how do you now build past it such that it's not going to happen again? Okay, so this is fairly standard, um, as is this next piece. So here we're talking about just the service delivery levels. As you're working with selecting your MSP, you're gonna to wanna to go through and make sure that you're, a, you're coming in at the right spot. Okay? Our sweet spot happens to be tier two and tier three. A lot of times we're working with the larger uh, Cognizance, Accentures of the world. They're providing the base help desk. 
um, that's your tier one. And um, in our case, we're now starting to build out more of the IT needs for the life scientists. So you're starting to get into the real product knowledge all the way down into the subject matter expert. Okay. All right, last piece is on continual service improvement. You don't deploy a managed service for today. You deploy it for tomorrow. You build it such that you're going to be able to measure everything. You're going to be able to report. And then there is an active effort to make it better. Um, a lot of times we're going to negotiate a, a three-year deal with someone. And the piece that they're saying is that over the course of the three years, you know, we're going to keep the price the same. And that's their incentive for, for doing the multi-year deal. We have to be more efficient then. Salaries go up, costs of employees go up, uh, but it's a case where how do we now clean up issues? How do we mitigate problems such that they don't keep happening? How do we educate end users such that our work is actually better? Um, and then once we've taken care of all of that, how do we look at the overall operation and become more efficient with how we're executing? Are the tickets being queued correctly? Do we have a good relationship with all of the IT stakeholders, with even the other service providers as we go in. Okay? But the real goal here is you're driving it, you wanna be better every single month. Okay? Um, last two pieces here, uh, I put a heavy emphasis on program sustainability. Okay? Most people go to a managed service because they're gonna be able to stabilize their foundation, they're gonna make sure that they're getting the right IT needs, but they're doing it for financial reasons. They may want fewer vendors. They want to save money. That's the other piece. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're going through this and talking how to improve the financial process as they're going through. Are you getting, again, more efficient every year? Are you managing your costs? That sort. Uh, and then the last piece I'll leave you with is, is environmental. Um, you have to pick someone who is the right cultural fit. They have to be able to interact not only with their managed service directors and their operational leads, but the individual technicians and analysts that are working on it. Are they aligning well with your company? Um, if you are a young biotech and things run fast, you know, are you getting the response from the MSP that you need in order to keep up? Do they understand the demands as they're coming through, such that you may need to keep a manufacturing line going? Hey, is it the right cultural fit? It's a tough one to judge, um, but it is something that you'll get a sense of as you're going through the initial presentations and the RFP process to really understand whether or not you can work with those people. Because um, the reality is this is a service that is delivered by humans. Humans make mistakes. Um, I say a lot, it's not so much the mistake that we make, it's how do we respond to that mistake? And then how do we ensure that that mistake doesn't happen again? Um, and a big part of how that response comes in uh, really carries your day. Okay, So I hope that was helpful in terms of just looking at a number of elements within the managed services. It gives you the ability to pick apart the different aspects to really question and push the managed service vendors as they come in. Are they coming in with the right governance model? Are they going to be measuring the right things? Do they have access to the employees? So all things which really go beyond whether or not they can respond to the ticket in, the, in a timely fashion. Okay. I'm going to pivot here and talk specifically about four different domain areas uh, within Asterix. Okay. Um, we've talked a lot about the overall methodology of how we go in and approach an MSP. Uh, but now what I want to do is drive into four specific areas. And these are the four areas which we've chosen to focus on. Laboratory computing, scientific application support, IT project management, and this is really project management for life sciences, and uh, business analysts for, for life sciences. Uh, these are all areas where we have had our customers come to us asking for support. Um, in some cases, it is niche work, okay? lab computing. It just can't be done by the same team that's managing your email and your Microsoft Office. Okay? Project management, they wanted to have the same people available 
for project after project after project, uh, but they didn't want to hire full-time people. So how do you go in and actually you know, take on those different tasks? Okay, so in the few minutes that we have left, um, I'll do a couple slides on each one of these, uh, and then we will move over to questions. So lab computing. Uh, the lab computing environment, this is, uh, the way we define it is if it's a PC in the lab, we own it. Okay. It's different than your laptops, your office PCs, anything that's in a carpeted area. Uh, you're now often dealing with standalone PCs that might be there for data access, um, but more often they're PCs that are tied to an instrument. And that instrument is going to present unique challenges. Um, in some cases, you know, you have operating systems that, that can't be moved. Um, we just did a, a recent Windows XP mitigation, and we found a Windows 2000 laptop. And that Windows 2000 laptop was running a balance. And it's the only laptop, it's the only OS that that balance will work. And the customer was adamant that they were going to just run it until it finally died. We worked with them, we isolated it, you know, so it's a standalone instrument. Uh, but it is that case of really understanding how does the instrument that it's attached to connect with it. And a lot of times there's unique issues around uh, antivirus, firewall, network access, all of that. We play a critical role in being the in-between when the scientist comes and says, I can't run my experiment. Is it an instrument issue? Is it a data issue? Is it a network issue? Is it a PC issue? So our techs are the ones that are actually out there working with the various groups to determine what it is uh, and really help that scientist get over their, their challenge. Mm -hmm. And we do play in regular labs, research labs, that sort of thing, um, but we also will play in regulated environments. So GXP environments, all of that. And so again, different needs, whether you're in research versus you're on a manufacturing floor, mm -hmm. but it's the idea that each of those has a process. The process becomes the methodology. The methodology is then followed and executed such that you're making sure that everything is running as needed. Okay. Lab computing MSPs, these are generally delivered on site because a lot of times we need people to go and actually touch the PCs. We need them to be in the labs. So the people who are doing this, they all have lab safety backgrounds. They understand what an HPLC is. They understand how to behave in a lab, which is a critical point. Okay. If we jump over to our second main area, it's scientific application support. Here we're looking at the applications that a scientist may interact with on a daily basis. These may be uh, curve fitting tools, they may be data query tools, they may be visualizations, um, but they may also just be the systems that are running the instruments. Okay? Uh, many companies, as we start to, to go through this and we, we do the inventory to kick off, they'll think they have 40 scientific applications. They'll often have between 100 and 150. Uh, you start to pull out all of the information around who holds the licenses. Sometimes it's a scientist, sometimes it's in the drawer under the PC. Uh, it's a case where it allows for a much more organized approach going through. We also work with customers on the MS, on the uh, scientific applications around roadmaps. Okay. What are you using for Agilent to run all of your systems? Do you have the same version of software throughout? Are you on the latest version of SoftMax? Are you keeping up to make sure that when we have to move off of Windows 7, we can go to Windows 10? You know, so all of the aspects around the scientific application and, and what is needed uh, is, is covered under this group. Uh, we do a lot of, um, it says tier one and tier two. Tier one is often done by the, the larger groups. We do a lot of tier two and tier three as we're coming through and, uh, and making sure that as the system or as the subject matter expert, uh, we're able to interact with that scientist, make sure we understand what the challenge is, and then go from there. Um, I talked earlier about making sure that you're your vendor has the right connections. Um, are they, do they have a, an inroad if they've got a question with something that's going on at Waters? Um, these are just an example 
of some of the applications that we have expertise in and we can comfortably deliver tier two and tier three service on. Uh, so ELNs and LIMS, um, right down to the CDSs and SDMSs, that's really our bread and butter. Um, but we go all the way out to your pure chem informatics and genomics work. So this is all in a standard lab environment. You see all the different applications. And, and as I said, this is, this is just an example. Okay. Last two um, we'll talk about is the IT project management, and then we'll do one on business analysts. Um, our approach to IT project management really depends on the company. Um, we have to work with them to get a full understanding of what type of project management are they interested in. Okay. Is it just that we're going to be providing PMs, and that works in terms of a supportive model or a governance model? Um, or is it a case where we're going to be coming in and, and now uh, applying the full PMO? Do they need us to, to create process for them? Do they need a standard way for all of the activities to be brought into the same house? Um, depending on what they need, this is how we'll, we'll go out and build this out. A lot of times it may start small, and then as the company grows, we continue to grow with it. Um, the nice part here is within the project management space, um, this is an area which is fairly well documented. So even if it's a small biotech that only needs one project manager as their MSP, um, that person within our group can actually go and bounce ideas off of the other project management MSPs that we have running within our, our, uh, our watch there. And so this gives the ability to have the same person on site. They learn how the company works. You can judge whether they fit within the culture because uh, the reality is the project management is one of those tough roles where they've got to do a good job to make sure the project stays on track. And often that requires putting pressure on people to, to make sure that they do all their parts. Okay. Um, last one, life science business analyst. It's a parallel to the project manager. So here's a scenario where we will bring in our guys, they follow a process, the process starts with requirements, it goes all the way through tech selection, right into full deployment and testing. Um, the business analysts will often be tied to not only life science IT, but you would have a life science chem IT person versus a life science biologics IT person. Uh, so it really gets in, gets more specialized as we're coming in, but we want to have that senior person who has the ability to, to really understand not just what the scientists may be asking in the moment, but how does it fit within the larger realm of that company and how does it set them up for future growth in terms of what comes next as they're building it all out. Okay. So um, just another area in terms of the domain that we focus on. So for us, it's really lab computing, scientific application support, IT project management, and life science business analysts. All being done is managed services. The services are led by on-site operational leaders. There is someone who is helping to guide them, which is the managing director's role. Um, and they're all building it up towards making sure that the service as it's being delivered continues to grow in a way where it's becoming more efficient year after year. It's becoming a better piece of the overall environment. Uh, and in the end, you know, it's, it's our resources that are now working with your scientists, your IT partners, uh, and they're, they're building that foundation as we go forward. And so uh, with that, I will wrap up. And we will look to any questions. Hey, Chris, it's Kevin. I'm back on. That was great. I much appreciate it. Um, so a couple of things. <clears throat> there was a few questions on the floor that I wanted to uh, kind of bring up here. Um, pretty, pretty interesting ones as well. Um, so the first one was, you know, in terms of where you can get training. Right. So um, I think that, you know, the main thing there was like, if you want to become kind of a limbs administrator, you know, how do you go about that process? What's a, what's a way to get started? The person wants to clearly become uh, a limbs administrator. Do you have any, do you have any advice or, or recommendations for that? Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting piece because, because a lot of our professional service people 
um, you know, they've got 10 years experience, they've got 15 years experience, you know, so when you start to ask the question of, well, how do you get started? Um, you know, that that's a that's a different question. Now, uh, one of the things that, that we do um, within making sure that we have the resources for our managed services is to build out training. And in those cases, you know, we're looking for somebody who is a scientist, they've been maybe working in a lab for a couple of years they have a bachelor's degree maybe a master's degree um, but they now have an affinity for the it side of it and that can be you know the, the pc side or the scientific application side um, if they have the right scientific background and then you have to ask yourself in terms of professional services do you have the right personality for it um, because it is an outgoing role you know, you're going to be engaging with people, you're going to be working with them, solving problems as you come in. Uh, every day is going to be different. You know, there's rarely a day where somebody doesn't come to you and say, I have this challenge. Now, if you have the right personality for it, it then becomes a real good fit. You know, so you've got the science background, you've got the personality for it, you now have to do this training. Um, so if you were if you were coming to Asterix as an employee, you know, that's sort of the things that we're looking for as we build out. Um, on the flip side, most of these software houses have a small professional services team which is designed around deployment configuration customization that sort that's also a great place to get trained up um, so in the sense that you know you could go to waters you could be a waters empower um, analyst technician and now you're starting to see not only how does one company deploy uh, their their enterprise waters solution but what's the best practices how does it grow from there how does a large company deploy differently than a small company that bit so just different ways to, to go about getting that experience whether you're you're signing on with a company that is the specific owners of the software um, or you join a services company and you, you now grow up with them great that's uh, some great insight, Chris. Much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> another question that came up, I'll answer this one. Will you share the deck that was presented today? Yes. Uh, for those of you who went on early when we were doing kind of the, the initial. Oh, Chris, you can also stop the recording, by the way. We don't need to include this Q&A part with the recording, so you could just hit stop on that. Um, <clears throat> I'll, edit, I'll edit that. I'll edit the questions out at the back end of it. So, yes, you'll get a PDF copy of this as well as a video. Uh, so the video, uh, which we're stopping right now, uh, will go up to this point, and uh, we'll get that up on YouTube and send a link out to everybody with that, uh, along with the um, uh, along with the PDF copy. So other question on the floor was advantages of going, you know, to you know a managed service um, versus doing it yourself. I know you covered some of these, but if, if there was anything like, what is the one like major value prop that you're going to get? Um, when, when you go with the managed mad service or so we're trying to do everything yourself. But what would you say that it is, Chris? Yeah, I mean, uh, the most important thing is to select the right vendor. And, and I'm, I'll, I'll circle back to your question just, just with, with this, this first statement. Um, if you select the right vendor and, and you put them through their paces in the evaluation stage, by going with an MSP, you've now shifted responsibility of delivery outside of your organization to that vendor. You hold the, um, the SLA, the KPIs, you hold the contract. Um, they obviously want to succeed. Um, hopefully they're bidding on something which they can do. Um, and that's probably the biggest challenge is when they, they bid on something which is a stretch and they can't do it. Um, it, it ends up being difficult as an implementation. Um, but if you've got the right vendor, and they're going to take a professional approach to organizing the foundation of your service, it now shifts time to you. You're instead of dealing with every ticket as it comes in, you're now going to show up for a, a one hour meeting per week. You're going to have reports that are coming in on a standard basis. You're going to be able to keep a, in a, bit, a hand on the wheel. You know, you're going to be able to keep your view forward, uh, but it's going to be something where you can now start thinking in terms of, how do we standardize our application platform? How do we now um, get rid of this old lab notebook and move on to a modern cloud-based lab notebook? How do I now go out and execute uh, the, the real strategic projects which are gonna move us forward? So um, you know, if done correctly, it's, it's all about getting time back. 
Gotcha. Well, it's it's the age old adage where you focus on doing what you what you do for a living, you know, your business, and, and let others focus on the IT side of the fence. So it's it's certainly an, um, <clears throat> something that's you know an age old um, uh, directive that companies wrestle with. You know, do we do this internally? Do we outsource this so we can focus on you know making drugs? Right. So. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, something that has to be brought into consideration. So uh, one other thing, you know, if you're, if you're to stand in front of a room full of folks and, you know, you have 30 seconds to say, you know, what makes Asterix difference? Why, why should a company invite Asterix in um, to, you know, be their managed service provider? Um, you know, what would your response be to that, Chris? Yeah, it's the people. Um, yeah, and this is, this is the main reason why I joined the team. Um, when, you, when you start to work with the various professional services people that are out there, you realize that you know, they're, they're not only experts in what they do. Um, they've, they've seen lab vantage systems deployed. They've seen SQL limbs challenges, um, but they're able to engage in a way where they're going to pull out all of the needs of the group. They're going to have those conversations. They're going to take the time and be patient to, to make sure that they fully understand where you want to go. What is the environment that, that you want to build as you're going? Um, and then they stand by you as they're as they're building it. It's you know, it's not the largest professional services group out there, um, but it's one of those cases where as you start to work with the people, um, you truly see the domain knowledge and the technology expertise coming forward. Um, and then, you know, the the other piece is these guys really love this work. They love this space, and working with people who enjoy their jobs makes it just you know, much easier to, to actually go forward and, and, and deliver what you need to deliver because, um, you know, you got their support. So. Appreciate that. I'm going to end on one more question. Um, I'll boil it down to this. Do you need to be a programmer in order to do this, to do this job? Um, or, or, you know, someone has, you know, lab and they have some laboratory experience, they have laboratory informatics experience, they've used limb systems, but I guess the question is, do you need to be a programmer? So if you think in terms of programming as, you know, software development, uh, there certainly is an element for that. You know, so if you want to go into a, a role in sort of life science IT managed services, um, especially in the software application space, uh, there is a need for people who can go out and do extensions, to do integrations, uh, to bring that forward, to go out, really use software development kits, APIs, that, that kind. Um, it's just one slice of the pie, though. And the reality is we've got a lot of project managers and BAs that, you know, they can't code a, a line, but they understand how to take requirements. They understand how to interact with scientists. They build those requirements and then convert them into test cases such that, you know, they're pushing the programmers. They're making sure that the programmers have all the inputs and outputs that they need. Um, so there's the, the short answer is no, you really don't need to be a programmer. Um, certain aspects of it, yes, but for the majority of the work that we do, um, you're, you're looking at technical expertise, you're looking at scientific domain knowledge, uh, it's the ability to interact with scientists and solve problems. Um, and that, you know, the reality is the, the problem solving is the biggest piece. Great. Uh, so if you're, you're coming into this space, you know, you, you have to have that, that appetite to keep learning, keep doing stuff, and, and then going from there. Now, all that being said, if, if I have a coding project and you're not a developer, I'm not going to hire you for that project. You know, so just that that one space. Gotcha. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. We're going to end it on that. So, um, you know, Chris, uh, many thanks for some really insightful information, answers to questions, etc. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not in this space myself, but I, fi I found your presentation very easy to follow and very interesting. So I hope everybody on the phone did as well. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap the session up. Keep an eye out for um, the materials that will come across your desk in the next day or so. Um, they'll, they'll come, you know, from, from Asterix. Um, you can obviously reach out to Chris directly if you like. If you have some questions, you want to kind of hit him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you see his, his contact information is up here, and we'll leave this up here for, for a few minutes so you folks can kind of screenshot that if you want uh, to go ahead and reach out to him. You can also go out to the Asterix website, and there's a contact form on the website. You can just mention in the comment section, hey, you know, I was on your webinar and I have a question about this or a question about that. And we'll get that to the right people <clears throat> right away. Um, I posted up in the chat. Have a look. There is a link uh, to the February webinar. You can just click on that right from the chat, and it'll launch in a new browser. Um, you know, the registration page for that. So I certainly encourage everybody, if you liked what you heard today, <clears throat> uh, to please, you know, 
jump on and 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 hear what we have to say about data integrity um, uh, on February 27th. So with that, we'll thank everybody for your time today. We hope it was worth it, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll hopefully be talking to you soon in other capacities. So the session's now complete, and uh, go and have a great afternoon. Chris, for your purposes, uh, internal discussion, um, when you exit out of the system, you should get a pop-up, uh, which is going to say okay. you wish to process the video. Uh, go ahead and accept that. It should process the video down to your local machine. It should say choose a location, and you can just choose your desktop if you want. I think worst-case scenario, it'll probably store it in um, – in uh in go to webinar but worst case scenario make sure you hit the convert button so we at least get that video converted up and then i can pull it down and do it in youtube okay do you want to take back organizer it doesn't matter so that i don't mess this up uh it doesn't matter because you recorded it on your on your side of the fence so um, okay. i'll try that um but i, I don't think it's going to be an issue but like i said just keep an eye out for it and um like like I said, I'm an organizer as well. So, but like I said, it should pop up on your screen. Just keep an eye out for it. Just say yes, process it. Okay, great. We'll I'll connect up with you offline after that. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Right, thank Thanks you. Again. Okay. Everybody that's still lingering, have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll hopefully talk to you soon. The session's now complete. Uh, have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.